Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I return to the world of video games with Juno New Origins, which you probably have actually seen me playing previously because it was, prior to the 1.0 release, it was known as Simple Rockets 2. And I've been sort of using that on and off to envisage rockets, which, you know, I perhaps didn't have models for. Obviously, Kerbal Space Program is my first love, but this Simple Rockets, you know, Juno, it has a lot of cool things about it. So let's just launch a rocket while I explain what's going on. So originally Simple Rockets was this low uh, complexity game that was designed to run on smartphones. It was great, it was two dimensional, it was like Kerbal Space Program. You could have all the fun things fail in the same way. Then there was uh, Simple Planes, which basically added a 3D design element and added aircraft. So then they took that uh, 3D you know, building system and created rockets. So Simple Rockets 2, which was of course rebranded. This is absolutely marvelous. This rocket was actually designed by another user. I think Iron Man Elon Musk is, is the username. It's apparently this was built on iOS, which is even more impressive given how much time I've spent trying to work on that interface. So yeah, hit the space bar, uh, throttle to 100%, get those engines running, and then light the boosters. And we are moving, and right away I'm going to set this thing to start a gravity turn over. So one of the big differences between this and Kerbal Space Program is that most of the controls are designed to be flown with like an autopilot of sorts. Here, the, wow, this thing is not turning over. Here, what I'm doing, right, is I'm grabbing this to basically point in the direction that I want. And then I can, you know, say select uh, lock velocity and it will try to track that. I'm not pushing the control buttons, although that is still very much possible if I want to do that. This thing is moving very fast and I think I need to make it arc over a lot faster towards the horizon. Oh dear, wrong buttons here, I get confused all the time. So look, this does simplify things if you're, say, not a gamer. Say, somebody that doesn't want to spend all their time fighting against the control systems. But uh, for everyone else, you know, maybe maybe that's what you like. You know, you st I'm still using uh, the roll controls here to adjust the roll attitude and whatnot. So anyway, the amazing thing about this is that all these parts are tiny little elements that have been put together by the builder. Like this thing on the side is just like a fuel tank. This is an inlet apparently. Really? Okay, look there's a little cluster of rockets there. Like all these little uh, you know, black squares. Those are actually something that has been added in the part designer because somebody wanted it to look really darn cool. Really much look the part. Okay, uh, yeah, I guess how we getting close to burnout on these engines. 4% left. Uh, I think where our ascent angle is kind of steep here. Maybe we'll let this lock prograde and ditch those motors. Beautiful. Separation goes off. So look, this lets you simulate rockets. It lets you build out the stuff, lets you adjust the engines. But so does Kerbal Space Program. How does this differ in a way that makes you want to use this rather than, well, uh, our green old friends? Let's go back to the ship designer and we'll show you. Okay, so here we are in the ship designer. And the first thing to know is that like Kerbal Space Program has tons and tons of items. And while this has a fairly large selection, uh, it has way fewer. And the reason for this is that there's only like one fuel tank because fuel tanks are highly procedural items. You can grab it, stretch it, change the shape. And that's great if you're building a rocket. You only need the one thing. You only need to like tweak the one setting. You know, you can change your texture and whatnot, right? So we're going to work with this and I'm going to build a rocket, which is perhaps a little more. Oh, OK, I don't want to do that which is perhaps a bit better. Now, this is telling me my first stage has a thrust to weight of 3.98 and uh, delta V of 3 kilometers per second. That's pretty good, but I don't really need that much performance in an upper stage. So what I'm going to do is shrink this down, going to take that engine, stick it on here, and we're going to change the design of the engine. So there's lots of different 
engine cycles, gas generator one, gas generator two, staged combustion, or full flow staged combustion, pressure fed. Yeah, let's go with a nice, simple pressure fed engine. Look at the size of this thing. Now, this uh, has a specific impulse, if I select stage one, I can improve the specific impulse in a vacuum by stretching the nozzle. Right, there we go, in a vacuum, slightly better performance at the expense of having a slightly longer engine. I should maybe shrink this down a bit more just to make it a little less crazy. There, two, two kilometers per second of delta V, great. So now uh, we'll go in and we'll add a interstage. It automatically sizes to the correct you know, thing that you've already been working with. Then we will have the main tank. Again, we'll stretch this out a bit. Find a rocket engine. We have lots of things to choose from. You have these various solid motors. I'm going to choose the Mage, which is a standard gas generator engine. And again, go in here. Gas generator one. Kerosene, liquid oxygen. Wow, we have so much performance in that first stage. Starting thrust to weight ratio, 1.88. You know, we could actually shrink this engine down again. We don't really need that amount of performance. Yeah, look, that's pretty good. So we've got this. We can launch this. Okay, here we go. Throttle to 100%. Hit space. And there we go. We take off. Let's begin our gravity turn. We'll just turn to the west. Or sorry, to the east a little. And while this is accelerating out, we will ask it to hold that orientation because you can see the velocity vector is coming down. And if we followed that, I think we would arc over a little faster than we would like. So we're going to sort of, I, I guess I turned a little fast here. But that's fine because we all know what happens uh, when you don't turn enough. Uh, you get your launch site destroyed as ABL Space Systems found out recently. Okay. So, we're now going 160. Let's start to track that prograde vector. Yeah, this is a perfectly great space launch uh, simulator. It's simulating the aerodynamics, the thrust, the fuel flow, you know, redistribution or center of mass. It has power systems, it has thermal systems, it has everything you want. And instead of little green men screaming at you, you've got um, faceless figures in spacesuits that we presume are a little more human because they have, you know what, four fingers, right? And a thumb. So another important way in which Juno differs from Kerbal Space Program is it doesn't in model any internal physics. So when we launch something like this 11,000 ton monster, we don't have any flexing of the structure, which is one of the reasons why Kerbal Space Program has very poor performance with very large rockets, because it has to model all that flexing. Everything in Juno appears to be completely rigid, well, unless you have parts which are hinges or things like this. So you can get away with something that is absolutely monstrous like this. And in fact, something like this could be built and run on a mobile platform like iOS or Android. So yeah, this is supposed to be like a, a giant nuclear-powered uh, Orion drive system. Uh, I think the staging has not been checked, despite my, you know, advice. There we go. Oh yeah, beautiful! Look at this monster! At some point we will have to start firing the nuclear weapons, but until then, look! Look at this beautiful pattern that we're getting from this thing. Isn't science amazing? Yeah. So anyway, you can build very large objects and not have to worry about that. So it does sort of uh, reduce the incentive to build things one part at a time. Your Kerbal, there's a lot of encouragement to perform docking between spacecraft so you can build something really big. There's less of that incentive in Juno as far as I can tell. That being said, you know, if you build the hardware and you can track the things into orbit using the, you know, standard orbit management tools that we've come to expect, you can definitely get up and uh, rendezvous and dock. I, I, I kind of messed this one up largely because my spacecraft design had such terrible RCS performance, but eventually I got snapped in there, uh, didn't bend it too much. And yeah, you can go out for an EVA and ad admire your models from an astronaut's point of view. There's first-person viewpoint from the EVA if you want to use that. As I said, the characters you get to use are sort of faceless humanoids called Drews. 
None of them are you know, as exciting or as charismatic as the thrill master extraordinaire Jebediah Kerman. So anyway, if you're used to simple planes, you'll know that the aircraft are there. It's, yeah, it's basically an extension of that system and you can build pretty much anything you like. I mean, I don't know whether the aerodynamics are amazing. It's it's fun to build something. You can definitely uh, you can build something that looks a lot more realistic than your average Kerbal plane, and they fly just fine. Uh, it's even possible, of course, to fly from a first-person viewpoint, should you want to do that up here. Um, yeah, it, it works adequately for whatever you want to do. I don't believe there are propellers in it just yet. That was a plan for the 1.0 release, but I think they encountered some problems with it. But jets are plenty of fun, so why worry? But one of the coolest things you can do with this that you definitely can't do in Kerbal is that you have a programming capability. So you can take the pod and run a program on it. In fact, you, I think you can apply parts or programs to all sorts of parts. And there's a built-in editor which is designed to be usable by complete amateurs, right? It's not some cryptic programming language, it's something a bit looks a bit like Scratch, if you've ever used that. This is like a drag and drop language where you're basically, you know, you put the parts in, in the order, you drag them in and they hook up and you build your basic functions. So for example, this rocket will wait a couple of seconds and then it'll count down from three to zero. It'll then activate the stage, fly straight up with 100% thrust. And by the way, it's going to measure the acceleration as it does this. It'll then pitch over. Once it goes fast enough, it will then shut the engine down. And at some other point, it's supposed to light up the engine and land. And let's see how well this goes, because I don't know if I've run this recently. And you know what? We're not going to fly it from the planet. We're going to fly it from the moon. So the solar system that is used in the default game is a scaled down thing to make it more accessible to the average person. There we go. Countdown to zero, turning to 45. Isn't that beautiful? It's all being flown, not by me, but by whatever computer program that I've written in there. And so while this flies, let me summarize what I think about this. Now, obviously, Kerbal Space Program is my first love. There's a lot of great things about that. There's a lot of joy in snapping the pieces together quickly. This is a lot more configurable and in many ways is better as a ship builder. It does lack the soft body physics, which can be a challenge unto themselves. But uh, it adds the, you know, the programming capability, adds all that configurability. Um, it provides a fairly good experience for, you know, whatever you want to build with it. There is a career mode. It's nothing to write home about, but it's pretty much following the standards, um, your process of, you know, doing missions, getting offered contracts, earning money and potentially technology from them, and then using that to unlock extra parts. There's a lot of tutorials for building various sizes of rockets. There's a lot of variability in what you can actually build. Um, you can design your own planets in it, which is nice. It is a lot faster and more lightweight. And if you are playing on a tablet, like a, an iPad or a, a phone, this is the only option available because while you know modern tablets are fast enough to run something like Kerbal, it's never been ported. Okay, so we're coming down. We've got a number at the top which tells us when we're going to begin our uh, engine firing. There we go. If this sticks the landing, I'm going to say fly safe. Will it? Will it get down or will my code fail me? Coming down very close, cancelling those velocities. And yes, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.